All right. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat if you'd like to. We'll give it another minute and then we will get started. We have a lot of ground to cover. Seems like chat is disabled. Thank you for letting me know. Um, I will probably just had a very shy group. Um, <laughs> but uh, if you give me a minute to work that out, I will see if I can fix that. Right. Um, I'm still working on the chat, but uh, in the meantime, I'd like to get started. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar, A Journalist's Guide to CCS Greenwashing at COP28. While I introduce myself, I'm going to open up a very short two-question survey um, uh, that will help us understand how you heard about this panel. So I'm going to launch that now. Um, I'm Lindsay. I'm the managing editor of DSmog, and I'm thrilled to be moderating the discussion ahead. Our three panelists, who I will introduce momentarily, will help you understand what carbon capture and storage, often called CCS, is, and will share tips on how to cover it. This webinar is aimed at journalists, but of course, all are welcome. Um, we've built in plenty of time for your questions, so please put them in the Q&A function as they come to mind. I will try to get the chat working as we're talking. Um, the panelists you'll hear from today have between them decades of experience covering CCS and the fossil fuel industry. Uh, Michael Buxbaum is a veteran energy and climate photojournalist currently based in Madrid. He first covered CCS in the early 2000s while working for the Illinois Clean Coal Institute, which at the time was trying to land the future gen, I don't know if I said that right, future gen CCS project, one of the earliest in the US. Since then, assignments have taken him to mines, power plants, and industrial facilities throughout North America and Europe. Since 2015, he's written extensively about solutions, he put that in quotes, so I figured I'd put it in quotes, uh, projects and CCS for publications, including energytransition.org. Uh, Deu Deutsche Welle? Deutsche Welle. Deutsche Welle, thank you. And now DSmog. Um, with us also is Jeff Dembicki, an investigative climate reporter with DSmog based in New York. He is the author of a book called The Petroleum Papers, which was one of my favorite reads last year. He didn't ask me to say that, just being honest. <sighs> He has covered the political uses of CCS, that is, how the fossil fuel industry, particularly in Canada's tar sands, is pushing it as a way to extend oil production while appearing to the public and policymakers as a climate leader. Um, and last but not least, we have Matthew Green, who is DSMOG's global investigations editor and has led much of our CCS coverage. He previously worked as a climate correspondent at Reuters and as a correspondent for the Financial Times. Um, we're going to dive in with uh, 
a moderated panel. I have a couple questions for each of them, and then we will open it up to Q&A at the end. Um, so Michael, our first question is for you. Could you please kick us off with a brief explanation of what CCS is and who um, at a high level, so governments, international agencies, companies, et cetera, is promoting it as a climate solution? Well, um, yeah, thanks, Lindsay, for this opportunity and for the challenging task of briefly trying to explain this incredibly complicated and confusing technology, which I don't think I'll be able to do briefly, but I'll try. Um, to be clear, uh, CCS has become something of an umbrella term for you know, now meaning any sort of technology that covers or that captures CO2 and injects it underground. And that includes CCUS, which uh, the U stands for utilization, or BECCS, which is about bioenergy or biomass is you know, captured, or the CO2 from burning biomass is captured, uh, or also blue hydrogen, where the methane is transformed into hydrogen, and then the resulting CO2 is captured and stored. Direct air capture is another form of CCS where the CO2 is taken out of the air itself and removed, uh, or set up a smokestack, and then you know is is also somehow stored. But you know, also, you know, trees also work really well for carbon capture too. But that's a different matter. To but to understand CCS maybe a bit better, let's let me break the phrase carbon capture and storage down to its to its four parts. The carbon part refers to, of course, the CO two, which is you know pretty easy. The capture part is where it starts getting pretty complicated um, because not all CCS actually involves using stored or using CO2 that is produced from industrial activities. Uh, in fact, a large portion of what industry calls CCS actually uses mined naturally occurring CO2. What the CCS proponents generally refer uh, here to is the portion of CO2 that is captured, but you know, the smokestacks actually uh, you know, attached to different types of industry. So, so what, what this, the, the captured part is also a bit problematic because there's different amounts of capture, CO2 that's captured. So that's a, also another point. It's not always 100%, certainly not often 90%, quite a bit less. Um, it's an open question as to how much is actually being captured. Then there's the ampersand or and part of the CCS, which actually does some very heavy lifting. Uh, this and refers to how the captured CO2 is transported from where it originates and where it is later going to be theoretically stored. And that's actually really significant because you really need dedicated CO2 pipelines to go ahead and move the CO2 from one point to another. It, it often will wreck non-dedicated pipelines. And for that reason, we see a very rapidly growing uh, CO2 pipeline network and transport network forming. And then lastly, there's the sequestration or storage part of this, which you know is also very, very complicated too. There's about 40 odd million tons of CO2 that is stored or is captured and stored annually. Uh, most of it is injected either into deep geological layers, uh, or much of it, I should say, uh, which is generally saline aquifers where the CO2 then displaces some saline, or salty brine water and fills up pore spaces left behind. And in theory, it stays there forever. But what's far, What's much more common actually for, for the CO2 that's being captured is the CO2 is then sent into depleted or depleting oil and gas reservoirs where it then through the magic of physics frees up more remaining oil and gas in these reservoirs from their host rock. And then that CO, that, that CO2 then pushes that oil up to the surface where it can then be used for all kinds of other purposes. And that's called a, pro as a process called EOR, enhanced oil recovery, which I think Jeff, you're gonna detail that a little bit later, but essentially for every one ton of CO2 that's put down hole into an oil and gas reserve, you're producing, you can displace and produce another two to five barrels of oil. So that's obviously one reason why the industry likes it. Um, but you know, in the process of doing this of EOR, some of the CO2 does come back up, some of it, some of it does remain, and that's kind of where CCS gets its term as a solutions technology. Um, as to which entities are promoting CCS, it's also rather complicated. Uh, certainly, the oil and gas industry is very big on this for many, many reasons. They're allies as well in the petrochemical and the steel industry and oil and gas. All the services industries are also really excited about this technology. The pipeline industry is very excited about this. It is, it is, you know, they're promoting this because they see it for many reasons. The growth industry for themselves, a way to extend production. But it's also something of a rhetorical shield to enable them to continue to do business as usual with this idea that it's going to become a technology which will help solve some of the climate issues. 
and and they also see CCS as a way to help push um, hydrogen, which requires using much more fossil methane, which is marketed as natural gas or shipped by LNG, and that that the can be transformed into hydrogen in the future. So any stakeholders in the oil and gas industry are certainly very excited about this, banks, leaseholders, et cetera. And then most of the petro states uh, that, that you know, are also big supporters of this technology since it allows them to keep existing or expand production. And by petro state, I mean the United States as well as in Canada and Norway, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, they're all big CCS proponents. Uh, the current UK government is also uh, trying to foster a CCS sector, as is the EU, but for perhaps some different reasons. Um, and finally, in terms of international agencies, there's actually been something of a subtle pushback uh, on CCS that's developing a bit more recently. The you know, IEA, ARENA, others have stated that CCS is not in and of itself a, a proper climate solution for power generation, nor oil and gas refining, as it doesn't really reduce overall CO2 especially when that CO2 is captured and then used for enhanced oil recovery. And then, but where you do see uh, some NGOs like Bologna and E3G and others that are making uh, a case that it can be used in goods in, in, in a proper way with ethanol or with cement production, steel, these so-called hard to abate industries, but combined those sectors are just about 25% of all emissions or emissions at this point. So you know, and, and again, that CO2 storage only makes sense if it's in a geological space and not for UR. That was a very long answer to your question, but it was a very complicated question in some respects. Thank you so much for distilling that down for us. Yes, CCS is very complicated, um, but you explained it in a wonderful and succinct way. Um, Matthew, Jeff, do you have anything to add to that before we move on? Um, nothing to add at the moment, no. All right. Um, well, one thing that uh, Michael said that stood out to me was for every one ton of CO2 that you pump down into an old well, um, you can displace two to five barrels of oil in this process that he described called enhanced oil recovery. Um, that, I think, is a nice segue into my question for you, Jeff, which is tell us a bit more about why the fossil fuel industry is so keen on CCS. Well, a basic principle of the fossil fuel industry in a way that I've sort of understood it over my last decade or so of writing about this industry is that it will do or say anything to ensure its survival. And so during the 90s, um, when the world was first waking up to the science of climate change and the dangers of it, the strategy was um, undermine the science, attack the people um, doing research on climate change. And then, of course, that that shifted over the years. It's no longer acceptable for the heads of major oil and gas companies to say that climate change isn't real anymore. And, and so now we see that most of these companies, if they do talk about climate change or or the industry being a part of the solution, it's always in terms of carbon capture and storage. I think it's fair to say that that, that is the number one climate technology put forward by the oil and gas industry. And so naturally, as, as a journalist, um, I'm thinking, you know, an, an industry that launched this reckless disinformation offensive for decades and tried to confuse the public um, about the science of climate change isn't necessarily um, a, a good faith actor in trying to come up with solutions. And so what does this industry have to gain by, by being so um, aggressively behind carbon capture and storage? And, and so one thing that the industry can gain um, is being able to pull more oil out of the ground, as, as Michael said. And um, a lot of the, the pilot projects and other experiments with carbon capture have involved um, extracting more oil out of reserves that um, have been close to depleted. And, and so um, that's obviously beneficial for the industry. They can get more oil and they could sell it and burn it. Um, it's not very good for addressing climate change, of course. And, 
and I, I, th I think maybe we can maybe we can get into this in the additional questions, but I, th I think the major utility of of this technology right now is is for polluting industries to say that um, they are very committed to fixing climate change. And so if, if anybody wants to attack their credentials on that or say that they aren't part of an energy transition, they can point to these $10 billion projects that they're supposedly supporting. They, they have scientific reports they can point to. They have negotiations with government. It all seems very serious and high level until you start drilling down to the amount of carbon that's actually sequestered by these operations. And it's, it's not very much at all. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think that uh, one other thing that could be interesting to talk about is in addition to sort of um, uh, helping maintain social license um, for these fossil fuel companies by appearing to be invested in, you know, climate solutions, there are now, at least in the United States, uh, pretty hefty financial incentives on the table. Um, I'll open it up to all of you, but um, this might be a good opportunity to just briefly touch on, on um, the Inflation Reduction Act and the 45Q tax credit. Jeff, is that something you want to take or someone else? Yeah, I, I can touch on that that briefly, and a, a lot of my expertise on this is in, in Canada too, where there's a similar situation, but basically through the Inflation Reduction Act, which is ostensibly a major piece of climate legislation proposed by the Biden administration, and, and it is um, leading to large investments in um, legitimate climate technologies, but there's also these these big carve outs for the fossil fuel industry in the form of tax credits for carbon capture and storage. And these can be quite massive. We're talking, you know, billions and billions of dollars. Um, and, and in Canada, there's something similar happening right now where all the major tar sands companies have said that they're going to get to net zero um, emissions by 2050 and the way that they'll do that is through carbon capture and storage as well and so this this includes companies like Exxon which operate in both countries but the the catch always is whether it's through the Inflation Reduction Act or whether it's through the negotiations happening in Canada or other places around the world the oil and gas industry says it cannot make this technology work without massive public investment. In Canada, the cost of the CCS plan that oil sands companies want, um, they want two thirds of that covered by the government. And, and so essentially, taxpayers are being asked to, to put forward billions of dollars towards a plan that is um, a rhetorical shield against actual climate advocates and, and legitimate green technologies um, in order to ultimately extend the lifetime of oil and gas production. Yeah, everything you said, absolutely. I mean, the, the 45Q in the States too, you know, has really helped to jumpstart even more projects around the country. I think it's something like $80 a ton of C, uh, is, is what the companies can go ahead and claim for uh, that for any ton of CO2 that's put down whole, it's 60, I think $65 a ton for, for every ton that is attached to, to EOR as well. So they make money both ways. And for direct air capture, it's even higher. Uh, we reported that there are, there's the potential for something like $100 billion of subsidies on the table for the CCS industry over the next few years. And, and because there is no necessarily uh, sunset clause for some of these tax breaks in the US. So that's, whereas the US was already the leader in CCS technology before this, it is now really, um, it's just mushrooming. The technology, the, the, the industry there is just mushrooming as it, as it just enjoys soaking up this, these tax credits. Yeah, and I, I think just to make a quick point about that, there's been a lot of discussion over the years about governments reducing 
subsidies to the oil and gas industry. And I think we could fairly see these tax credits for carbon capture as a massively new subsidy for oil and gas that's um, instead being framed around climate action when it's really about increasing the ability of oil and gas to survive climate policies. And for that matter, around the world, you're starting to see other governments or, or industry rather claiming that unless or until they get something like an IRA-like package, it might make it difficult for them to go ahead and do or develop CCS technologies in their home countries. That's part of the discussion that's going on in the UK. That's part of the discussion going on in the EU as well. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of, um, uh, I think we we have seen many times that fossil companies are not interested in CCS or it's not financially viable until um, these tax credits come along. Um, so Michael, I'm gonna throw it back to you uh, to drill down into CCS's track record for a minute. Um, okay. Again, another complicated question, um, but I'm gonna, I'm going to um, sort of throw two questions at you, two related questions. One, is it fair to call CCS a false solution um, as it sometimes gets called? And um, are there legitimate uses for it? Or is it, as we've been talking about, mostly just uh, a way for fossil fuel companies to extend their social license, extend their production, things like that? Well, the one way in which CCS is, have, has a really, really proven track record is in enhanced oil recovery. That that works. And and the industry has shown it that the technology has proven itself to work time and time again. Um, and so there's a real direct relationship between oil prices and if CO2 capture actually works. So in that sense, yes. Um, the It's interesting that as well that, you know, recently the there is a project in Brazil that was able to go and store more than 10 million tons of CO2 uh, last year, all of which was used for enhanced oil recovery. And the industry is, or at least the, the CCS you know, backers are not really promoting it very much, despite the fact that it, it achieved this huge level or huge number, because it of course was all attached to enhanced oil recovery. And I think the industry knows that that's not a really good starting point or convincing argument for why we should do more carbon capture technology, why we should implement it further. Um, yeah, I mean, what they, what the industry, what CCS has proven itself to do is not necessarily remove a whole lot of CO2 from the atmosphere either way. I mean, even if it's just, even if it's not necessarily attached to enhanced oil recovery, it hasn't actually removed a whole lot of CO2, especially if you look at it in the context of upstream and downstream. So if in the case of in Norway, where you have two of the oldest or one of the oldest and, and supposedly a pioneering project and a landmark or a lighthouse project uh, for carbon capture, they are capturing or they're, they're separating the, the CO2 from native um, gas, natural gas, methane, essentially. And so as they go ahead and, and refine this methane, they have to remove the CO2 because it's too carbon intense for pipeline grade. They take that CO2 and they put that under the North, uh, North Sea, and then this, the, the refined methane is then sold onto the market. And you can argue that although they have taken a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere, or out of out of that uh, not out of the atmosphere, sorry, but out of the ground, um, they have produced because they then that that methane is then sold and then burned. It releases a lot more CO2, and the there are certain studies that say that about 25 times more CO2 has been released into the atmosphere than Norway has actually stored as a result of that. So. Does it really work? I mean, if you cherry pick the data, then yes, it works in a very small way to go ahead and remove a certain segment of the CO2 that is produced. But these are all, almost all carbon capture projects are attached to some sort of petrochemical project. So they're producing CO2 at every step along the way. When you go ahead and mine coal, because there, there are three coal fired carbon capture plants around the world. Um, when you produce coal, you release methane as well. There's a lot of methane that's being, that is sort of in every coal field. So that gets released. And then of course you, you know, you, what, you have to burn something to go ahead and transport that coal to the power plant. The same is true with, with, um, with a lot of these gas power fired plants that then have some sort of CO2, uh, some sort of CO2 capture. 
attached to them or the gas refineries that have some sort of CO2 capture attached to them too. Plus you have to go and run the CO2 capture plant as well. And that also generally requires something to be burnt. And that carbon is generally also not captured. So at every step along the way, there's only a small segment of the CO2 that's actually prevented from going in the atmosphere. And it's often dwarfed by how much CO2 is produced by what is refined or what the end product of those plants are. So that, that you know, sorry, it's also a long explanation to a, a complicated question. In terms of where, where, where this could work, where CCS could work, if you're going to make a legitimate use case out of this, and, and props to Bologna, E3G, and a few other NGOs for doing some work around this to create like a CCS ladder, which I urge people to go ahead and take a look at, they do talk about where the best use cases are. And surprisingly enough, they're not around gas-fired power plants, not around gas technologies at all. They say it does, can be best suited for certain cases, some steel applications, cement, concrete, uh, or, or ethanol. Ethanol is an interesting conversation too, because in the process of creating ethanol, you oftentimes produce a pure CO2 stream. And so it doesn't require a whole lot of technology to go ahead and separate that out from other gases when it comes out the food stack. Um, but again, it also comes down to how that CO2 is then later stored. If that CO2 is stored in a way which produces more oil or gas, mostly oil in this case, it doesn't help at all. Um, and for those who don't know, can you just explain briefly why it might be um, beneficial around steel and I think you said cement production? Yeah, I mean, it's I, I'm not an expert in these in these topics and, and there are others who can probably describe this much better than I can. But my understanding is that in most situations, there is not another way to go and produce steel or concrete or cement without burning something, without emitting something. Now there's arguments been made against that as well. There are different technologies out there that can do this, that can produce steel, that can produce cement or concrete in a way that doesn't produce a whole lot of emissions, that isn't, doesn't involve things being burned. Is that something which is economically viable? That's a great question. Um, and that's something which a lot of scientists and people are developing now. There are ways to go ahead and do this otherwise, you know, without burning things, without requiring coal. But these are the so-called hard to abate sectors. And unless there's even more subsidies out there to go ahead and, and, and help these industries along, this might be the best use case. And we're talking in that case only about maybe 25% of all the CO2 emissions from industrial activities. So it's, if you could say, if you can argue that, okay, we're going to move over to a purely electric system, except for coal, except for concrete and steel, then, and you're, or you capture everything, you really capture all the CO2 emissions from the other power plants, then okay, 75% of emissions have been reduced. But it's, it's a very theoretical conversation. Yeah. Um, Matt, Matt or Jeff, anything to add to that? I, I think it may be worth just underscoring the role that CCS is expected to play at the COP28 uh, climate negotiations, which obviously are starting at the end of this month. Uh, there's been a huge amount of um, rhetorical interest in CCS in the build up to the talks. Obviously, the president, uh, Sultan Ahmed Al Jaber, is the head of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Corporation. Um, and he gave a, a speech back in June saying that we need to be laser focused on fossil fuel emissions, uh, which might sound like a rather innocuous statement. But of course, what he's basically saying is fossil fuels aren't the problem if we can capture the emissions uh, using CCS. Um, and that, of course, is the very essence of the problem that, that Jeff and Michael have been describing. Even if the technology was commercially viable, it would have to be deployed at such a gargantuan scale to make any kind of difference to the climate that it's it's inconceivable that this will ever happen. It, it was it'd be literally like building an entire oil industry in reverse over the next 10 or 20 years. And, and even though we've seen a big uplift in uh, intentions to invest in CCS projects by, by many oil and gas and other companies, it's still a pinprick relative to what would be needed on, on a climate relevant scale. But the problem, uh, as, as Jeff and Michael have explained, is that just mentioning the phrase carbon capture has a kind of <laughs> 
palliative effect on climate anxiety. This for people who aren't really paying attention can sound like the industry has got this in hand. Um, and even in in Abu Dhabi, um, which is ramping up oil and gas production dramatically over the next few years, they're talking about a CCS project on it on the Habshan gas field that will be the equivalent of removing 50,000 cars from the road. Well, it, it may well capture that much CO2, but only in the process of producing vast amounts of new oil and gas. So this is, I think, the, the, the reason why we've come here today is that as journalists, we need to be so clear about what this technology actually is and contrast that with the uh, way it's being presented um, by the COP president, um, but also virtually every other oil and gas company that essentially wants to use the technology as a license to continue with business as usual. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to add something really quick to that, because I think you're exactly right, Matthew, about the palliative effect that saying carbon capture has on people, and especially policymakers. Um, in Canada, the top tar sands companies have explicitly said in submissions to the federal government that if carbon capture technology is successful it will allow them to sell more of their oil on the global market because they'll advertise it as green net zero oil and this is anticipated to to open up new markets for the industry all over the world because it will technically be greener than oil in other parts of the world, or that's the industry's logic anyway. And since the vast majority of emissions um, from a barrel of oil come from actually burning it, you've actually made climate change worse while pretending that you've achieved this massive victory in solving climate change. Yeah, and, and just to underscore that, we're seeing that dynamic playing out at or we'll be seeing that dynamic playing out at, at COP28 because we've had this deal struck between ADNOC, obviously the Abu Dhabi National Oil Corporation, and Occidental, the big US oil company that is positioning itself as a carbon management company uh, to develop systems to capture CO2 directly from the air and store it, known as direct air capture. And we're seeing companies lining up to buy carbon credits on the basis of a promise to remove this CO2 from projects that haven't even been built yet. Um, so you're absolutely right, Jeff. The, 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 the power of the oil industry or the, the intent of the oil industry to use these technologies to provide this false sense of security while actually ramping up production is is quite extraordinary and, and and to see this taking center stage at cop 28 in a way that we've never seen at any other cop is really something quite extraordinary um and unprecedented in the uh, history of climate diplomacy so given that um i think what we want to spend the remaining time of the panel focusing on is given this unprecedented push for um CCS, direct air capture, other uh, technological solutions to extend the life of fossil fuels. How, as journalists, do we cover this? Um, I have one remaining question for the panelists, which I'm going to ask all of them to answer. Um, in the meantime, if you have questions, please start dropping them into the chat. We have some great ones in there. We'll leave the, the end of this for some Q&A. Um, I'm going to ask the same question of all of you. I'm going to start with you, Jeff. Um, please tell us about one CCS story that you've reported. How did you find it? How did you entice an editor? Uh, Matthew, for you, that version is what made you say yes as an editor. Um, and what are some potential ideas or areas that are ripe for investigation across different geographies? Essentially, how what would you tell other journalists who are interested in reporting on CCS? So I'll, I'll talk about um, a New Republic story that I did a couple years ago. And, and it's, it is difficult to, to land a pitch about 
carbon capture for all of the reasons that we've discussed. It can seem kind of, you know, overly technical or sort of dry, complicated. And so it's like, how, how do you make that pop for readers or even for an editor? And so the, the, the two strategies that I've kind of settled on is um, linking carbon capture to someone in public who is already well known, who has a reputation, good or otherwise. And then this, the second thing is, is showing the ways in which internally the industry itself doubts that this technology will be successful. And so I, I attempted to do both of those things in this New Republic story. I saw that there was a new report out from the industry group, the Global CCS Institute. And in this report, it acknowledged that over more than a decade of promoting the technology, um, the amount of successful operations had actually declined slightly over a decade, which is really not a promising arc for a technology that's hyped up so much. And then I linked that to um, US Senator Joe Manchin, who huge parts of the climate community had real issues with. He had been like the one of the major blockers of earlier aggressive climate legislation in the United States. So Joe Manchin was was very well known. And so between those two pieces, the the editor was was excited about signing the story. And I think it carried the headline like Joe Manchin's favorite climate technology is a bust or, or something like that. And what, um, could you tell us a little bit more about the pitch process? Like, did, was it just you sent an email and the editor said yes right away? Or was there some kind of um, like back and forth around the idea? My original pitch, I believe, was mostly just based on that that industry report that had come out, and the editor was was interested in it, but was was looking for a way to sort of make that a bit more in, enticing um, or attractive to readers, and and that's when I saw that. Joe Manchin had been doing all of these press conferences, hyping up CCS. And at the time he was really seen as like climate enemy number one in the United States. So when, when I brought him into the pitch, that kind of, um, I, I think that's sort of what like pushed it over the line. And then um, the, the editor was enthusiastic about assigning it. Great. Yeah, that's an excellent strategy, tying the story to someone who's already in the news, already related to climate change in some way. Um, and I should mention that we'll be sharing after this by email with all of the attendees a tip sheet on how to report on CCS that includes some resources, some stories, some sort of like broad avenues for investigation like this. Um, okay, Michael, I'm going to turn the same question to you next. Please tell us about a CCS story you have done, um, how you found it, how you interested in the editor, um, and sort of what kind of like, uh, what you think broadly made it successful. Um, I did a story a few years ago for Deutsche Welle, and it was really based uh, based on CCS. And the sort of the tie into this was trying to reframe CCS as an oil company production technique i.e. a lot of the conversation around CCS has been for a long time around applications. Is it best here? Does it work? How much does it store? How much CO2 is captured, et cetera? But what is very rarely discussed, and, and I see this all the time also still in the, in the, in the, in the press, and then in the general press, is that they really don't talk too much about how that CO2 is stored. And once you recognize that the CO2 is actually used to produce more oil, it totally changes the conversation. And when I initially proposed that to, to the editors there, like, oh, is this real? Can this be, are, are, they thought I was a bit mad until they saw that there was actual evidence of this. And then once they read into it further, it changed the entire conversation around the, the, the story itself. And then we really led with this. Is this a solution or is this just another way to go and produce more oil? 
And then we tried in the story to go ahead and parse out the good, the geological storage from the enhanced soil recovery storage and to really break it down further. Um, and, and to my mind, that's probably still the story, the angle of the story, which is the most underserved part is why is this so interesting to the oil and gas industry? Why, what do they gain from this besides a, a license to continue operations or rhetorical shields we discussed? There, it's, it's complicated, of course, as all these things are complicated, but once you start to go into the nitty gritty of it all, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it's once you recognize, once you can show to editors that yes, indeed, that 50% of all the oil that was that, well, if 50% of all the oil that was there upon discovery may still be there and EOR can get it out can help produce this, that that changes the entire conversation, not only around this peak oil debate, but also around uh, seeing CCS as a way to go ahead and further the oil industry's predominance. And then when you can also link it historically back to the clean coal attempt, the clean coal movement. So when I was working on FutureGen, it was considered to be a solutions technology that would help move us away from the US, US at this point, help move us away from coal. And once it became linked to EOR, once it became linked to other things, then of course that changed the conversation. I think illuminating those historical links can be so powerful for readers. I um, I was reading a piece that you wrote for us recently, along with Edward Donnelly, in which um, you discuss how CCS was invented by oil companies, not with the intention of storing carbon, but for EOR. And then it got rebranded, essentially. I'm, I'm condensing and paraphrasing here, but... and. Yeah. You're right, exactly. And it not just re it not just paraphrase, but rebrand it. I mean, they were looking for some sort of a way to go ahead and show they were out front with climate issues. And this goes back into I think the 70s and 80s. Industry has been aware a long time that what they're doing is not good for the climate, not good for the environment, not good for the planet. And so they've been looking for ways to go ahead and clean up their act rhetorically. And they found yeah. this was to be a good one. Yeah, and it was it was really um, it felt very eye opening for me as a reader to understand that um, EOR wasn't like something that the industry discovered as a byproduct of CCS. It was the goal, and then it got rebranded as CCS. And so I think as a journalist thinking about what are those moments, what are those facts that will be eye opening for readers, is one way to um, really potentially sell an editor on a story. Yeah, and I one point to make too about the EOR component, which I think is super significant. One of the reasons why there's not more enhanced oil recovery happening today is the lack of CO2. I mean, it's, it sounds really stupid that we're producing so much of it goes in the atmosphere, but it's not like oil companies can get that necessarily. And this new movement towards embracing CCS will basically hand or could potentially hand the oil industry one of the best tools, one of the best feedstocks that they need to go ahead and produce far more oil than, than they could otherwise in a very inexpensive way, comparatively speaking, with the subsidies and also with this rhetorical shield around them. Yeah. Um, Matt, so I'm going to ask you the same question and you have both covered CCS as a journalist and as an editor. So I'd be, I'd be curious to hear your perspective from both sides. What, tell us about one story that you worked on and, and what, you found that either enticed you as a reporter or as an editor? Yeah, I think for me, the, the, the key has been to find ways to tie the development of a particular CCS project to an impact on a community um, to, to really show how this is affecting people um, uh, on the forefront of oil and gas expansion. And earlier this year, uh, DSmog in collaboration with Floodlight published a story in The Guardian, which looked at how the developers of a new liquefied natural gas export terminal in South Texas, in the Rio Grande Valley uh, near Port Isabel, uh, had basically pitched um, a CCS project or, or, or had, 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 after facing a lot of opposition locally and skepticism from investors even, had updated their design for this huge $10 billion export facility by adding a CCS project on top of it, essentially. Uh, and that CCS facility was designed ostensibly to capture the emissions produced by this terminal while it was super cooling 
fracked gas from the Permian Basin for export um, on specialized tankers um, from the Gulf, US Gulf. Now, that sounds great. And according to the developers of this project, it would be the greenest liquefied natural gas facility in the entire world as a result. But of course, the reality is that even if they did build this and capture some of the emissions, it would only be up to 5% of the total emissions associated with extracting, transporting, and then, of course, burning this natural gas to power power stations in Europe or Asia. And for the people on the ground in Port Isabel, environmental justice community, Hispanic, um, mostly uh, with some indigenous black residents as well, really uh, on the front lines of the fight against this fossil fuel build out, this use of CCS to greenwash the project was really the final straw. Uh, and so we opened the story um, with a scene from a meeting of um, local activists um, in Port Isabel, figuring out how they could continue this fight, um, which they've been going, which had been going on for six or seven years. Um, and it, it, it showed how these very often abstract concepts uh, descriptions of industrial processes, which, quite frankly, I, I didn't sign up to journalism to write about particularly, <laughs> but I am interested in what happens in these communities. Um, so that was a story where we were able to really tie all those levels together. Yeah, I think that having, um, particularly with a subject like CCS that can be very technical, can be feel daunting and complicated, being able to tie it to human impacts is really helpful. We published um, last week or the week before Dana Drugman published a similar story that she got. Um, and I'm going to bring it up because we mentioned this in the tip sheet as a strategy, but she went to an industry conference in May and heard at that conference, someone who works in the CCS industry say, we really want to do these projects only with the uh, full buy-in of the communities they're in. And she went, hmm. And went and looked at projects around the US and found all these examples of communities that were vigorously pushing back against projects and very clearly saying, we don't want these. And the companies were trying to push forward with the projects anyway. So um, I think that being able to tie stories to that human impact can be really powerful. And also sort of the other tip there is like, go to conferences, go to industry events, um, if they will let you in. I know that Jeff you have had some trouble with that, not with the CCS industry, but that's, that's a topic for another panel. Um, so I'm going to get into the Q&A now. We have some great questions in the chat. <clears throat> I'm going to start with one that I think gets at um, a lot of the things that we have been talking about, sort of, uh, just essentially that gets at how complex CCS is. So uh, Jay Austin, one of the attendees, said, thank you for sharing your ideas on how to report on CCS as a journalist. I'm curious about stories slash insight on how you'd communicate about this as a parent or child or friend. Um, so I think what Jay is getting at there, and, and Jay, feel free to clarify in the, in the questions, um, but is how do you take this complex thing and communicate it in a way that is accessible to a wide range of people, especially people who might not be um, as technically familiar with it. And anyone jump in to answer? I mean, I, th I think you can just say simply that the, um, the industry which has caused the vast majority of climate change and is even now accelerating us towards absolute global catastrophe, wants to get billions of dollars from people like you and I to fund technology it's not even certain about so that it can keep making climate change even worse. That's what I would say. I would imagine too that for many parents, of course, they're concerned about their children's well-being and hopefully their grandchildren's well-being as well. And this is an intergenerational problem in that not only are we trying to solve an issue, CO2 pollution, methane pollution, et cetera, but then we have to figure out a way to go ahead and monitor that CO2 storage for eons 
And so how do you go ahead and transform? How do you go ahead and enable the next generations, the next two, three, five, 10, 50 generations to be able to monitor that CO2 so that it never does leak up out of the ground? Thank you both. Um, I'm going to pop now to a question from Anne Grant. Um, Anne said, even if the technology were effective, would it really be economical to scale this up as opposed to changing much of our system to reduce emissions? I know we've touched on the sort of the financial aspects and how um, uh, government subsidies are really what is making CCS economically viable right now, but I figured it would help to just drill down into this a little bit more clearly. Would it be economical um, to scale this up as opposed to making other changes? Well, what what I can say is that um, in the early 90s, Exxon and its Canadian subsidiary, Imperial Oil, they um, privately studied several solutions that they saw as the most promising ways to address climate change. And um, one of the solutions they studied in the early 90s was carbon capture and Exxon determined at the time and wrote in internal reports that the technology was likely to only have um, marginal benefit for the climate and was too expensive to ever be deployed at scale. And what's what's striking is that almost every other major climate solution since then, including wind, solar, um, battery storage, electric vehicles, they have all improved at levels that nobody could have ever imagined. While the case that Exxon laid out in those reports in the early 90s basically hasn't changed that much. So I think that gives you an, an indication of how difficult it is to get these exorbitant costs um, lower down. Yeah, I, I, to echo that point too, I think I wanna also go back to what Matthew said a moment ago that in order for CCS to actually work, it's gonna have built out so in such a giant scale that you're basically asking the industry to double itself, maybe triple itself and then run itself in reverse. And okay, that's that sounds really amazing, but think about this for a minute, how invasive is the industry already? And so we're going to have to double and triple the scale and the size of the oil and gas industry just to go ahead and mitigate the problems the oil and gas industry has created. And to, to the, what Jeff said as well, every other technology like wind, like solar, geothermal, others, they're all reducing or have drastically, dramatically reduced in costs and in their own, hmm, their, their own presence, you know, in the sense that you can actually produce a lot more wind, you can produce a lot more solar now per unit than you could 50 years ago when carbon capture became a thing. But carbon capture prices have only increased and the questions around it continue to go ahead and be there. So it would be, it's a vast experiment when we already have the solutions we need to go ahead and solve all the problems that we have. Yeah, we, um... I'm going to turn to another question now and just a reminder to attendees to please put your questions in the Q&A function. I'm not monitoring the chat as closely as I am the Q&A box, but I saw a question come through in the chat that I thought was interesting. Um, it's from Clarissa Wright um, and Clarissa says, I have a geoscience background. Can you think of any topics you think I could investigate at depth from a geological lens about CCS storage? What key message should we communicate to energy professionals? Well, um, I'm going to go back to just that simple point. We, we, we don't really know much about how CO2 storage works. If, if it's been done, if CO2 capture and storage has been done for 50 years, it's not been monitored thoroughly for 50 years. Uh, there have been some questions about leakage in Wyoming. There have been some questions about leakage elsewhere where there has been no CO2 monitoring. And one of the problems that, that is faced, whether it whether that CO2 is put into saline formations or whether it's put into uh, oil and gas formations, there are so many holes we've punched into this into the earth at this point all around the world to dig for drill for something that we don't know what is actually there. So I think the question might be on a, uh, for, on a geological level for a scientist like that, 
what evidence do we have that this will work long term? I mean, it's one thing for it to work 20 years, 25 years, but that's nothing for geological terms. 100 years is still nothing for geological terms. What evidence do we have now, if we're going to make these investment decisions now, what evidence do we have that it is a surefire technique for four generations, five generations of humans to come? And I can maybe um, underline Michael's point there. Um, at the moment, there is a big fight taking place uh, behind the scenes around the accounting frameworks that are used to measure how much carbon is being stored underground. Uh, and these are highly technical, very obscure discussions um, that are being, uh, that are taking place involving various governments and the industry is pushing very hard for its own version of these accounting rules through a coalition called the CCS Plus Initiative, uh, which was founded by Total Energy, the French oil major, Occidental Petroleum's uh, low carbon unit, Oxy, um, and several other entities uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and they're really trying to write the script on these carbon accounting frameworks in the hope that they will be taken up by governments uh, and form an essential building block in what the oil industry ultimately sees as a fully interoperable global trading system of credits or carbon credits generated from these planned CCS projects. So these technical questions obviously are very important from a climate ad advocacy point of view, but they're also really um, a scene of contention um, for the industry itself, which has everything to gain um, from essentially writing its own rule book um, to determine how much money it, it can generate in subsidies and carbon credits from these projects so i mean that's lifting the lid on a whole nother level of the story which i've had a little look into but it's something that does deserve more journalistic scrutiny i think thank you um i i'm afraid we're gonna have to wrap it up here we have a lot of great questions um but i want to be respectful of everyone's time and this is booked for an hour um i will um for everyone who didn't get their questions answered, I'm going to drop the emails of our panelists into the chat. Um, I can't speak for them, but this is what they do. This is what they know about. I imagine they would be happy to follow up if you have some burning questions, especially from journalists in the audience. I will also put my email in the chat if you have feedback about the webinar. I'm happy to hear from you. Um, thank you so much for being here today, we will be sending out a tip sheet with resources, which I mentioned on how to report on CCS, um, as well as there were a lot of, um, I wasn't able to monitor the chat super closely, but I saw a lot of links flying. So I will comb through it afterwards and um, pull out those resources that were shared um, and share them with attendees as, all, uh, as well. Um, so please keep an eye on your inboxes. Um, thank you all again for attending and for asking such engaging questions. And for the journalists in the room, if any CCS coverage comes out of this panel, please share it with us. We would love to know, you know, just sort of what followed on from this. Um, thank you one more time to our panelists, Michael, Matthew, and Jeff, and to all of you for being with us today. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Take care, everyone. <laughs>